episode of the business of sports show today we are truly honored by having one of the greats of the game we have none other than australian legend david campisi with us david welcome thank you very much how are you uh very well thank you my friend how are you oh, not too bad it's a beautiful day up in uh, the gold coast in australia so can't complain uh, very good very good so for for those limited number of people who don't know who you are in the game, uh, introduce yourself. Introduce myself. Jeez, where do I start? Um, well, I started off as an arrogant little Aussie back when I was 19, playing for Australia. <laughs> when I went to New Zealand, uh, got off the plane and, um, and the New Zealand Journal asked me, what do you think about Mark and the great Stu Wilson? And I said, Stu who? So that sort of started my career from day one. Um yeah, I was very fortunate to to play for Australia for 15 years, uh, travelled the world, uh, lived in Italy for 10 years from the 80s to the 90s. Um, I married Lara uh, back in 2003, went to live in South Africa for 10 years. I coached with the Sharks um, for three years. Uh, won a Rugby World Cup 91, uh, Grand Slam 1984, a couple of low Cups. Uh, went to the Commonwealth Games in 98 as captain for Australia and won a bronze medal. So, yeah, I was uh, pretty fortunate to, I think, to play in the best rugby era that we've ever had. So you could say you've done a bit then. <laughs> uh, a bit. I want to try and be involved a lot, but um, it's very <laughs> difficult. As, as you can appreciate, uh, the game's changed a bit and uh, been cancelled by Rugby Australia because I don't sort of toe the line. I... If you ask me a question, I'll give you the answer. Um, on TV, it just seems everyone seems to follow a certain narrative, which is I don't think is great for the game, because 95% of the people who watch rugby know rugby, they know dumbos, yeah. and I think you can't fool them. So yeah, I was, mate, I, I just had a great career. I was very fortunate to be the right place at the right time, and uh, I tried to do many different things on the field. Some worked, some didn't, but uh, was never lack of uh, courage or trying to achieve something. And, and and I, I think it's great the way that you kind of started that in terms of you know, you know the who comments. I mean, did that stand you well in your career in terms of because from my kind of point of view and 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 what I know of your reputation and what other people have said, you know, you, you do have that kind of air of, of almost no airs and graces. You know, like you said, kind of tell it as it is. Kind of, did that get you into to trouble in your playing career? Oh, definitely. Yes. A, lo a lot of times. And still, that's why I've been cancelled by Rugby Australia. Seem to have followed me even now when I've retired. Um, yeah, look, my, my background is a government school background. Um, come from a small town called Queen Bean, 21,000 people. My dad was Italian, had no idea about sport, has beautiful garden, wines, grapes, uh, vegetables, chickens, rabbits. Uh, my mum was uh, a Murphy, so she was half Irish. Uh, had a brother, two younger sisters. And back in those days, the small country towns, rugby league was the dominating sports, uh, which I used to play from 8 to 16. Uh, played two years of Aussie rules, uh, won a golf championship at 15. And uh, what, back in 1979, I went over to watch a fourth grade uh, rugby union team. Um, and after the game, I said to the coach, well, do you need a fullback? And I started. And even to today, I still reckon that was the best year of my rugby life because I was very yeah. young, had no idea what I was doing. I played with all the 38-year-old, 40-year-olds. They would teach me as I was playing. And, um, yeah, I was I was quite uh, lucky uh, from 79 to 82, then get picked for Australia. So it was a very short trip. Um, I don't think it's – I think it would be very difficult to do that these days because all the academies yeah. back up. So – Look, I, I was in the right place at the right time and I just took every opportunity and, you know, I played with the guys called the Ellers back in the 80s and I looked at them and I said, I'm with you guys. So wherever they went, I followed and I learned. So, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned it there about, you know, doing it today in terms of now it's all academies and, and you know, that unconventional pathway that you took of 
kind of almost playing. Uh, I, I was, I was going to say simple club rugby, but kind of lower league club rugby, where you are up against the the old heads um, and and the uh, aficionados of the dark arts and and various things like that. Do you think that's kind of missing from the game these days? Yeah, I, I think what what I've noticed, um, like, for example, we've got a young guy, Peter Jorgensen, who played for the Wallabies when I played. His son's coming through the system. And last week, Rugby Australia said, oh, just to let you know, we beat Rugby League to Jorgensen, who plays rugby. Um, and we've beaten him to the clubs, and that's great that he's going to be with us. So he's already going to Australia A. He's just leaving school. The problem is he's got to go. He should be playing Colts. Yeah. He should be playing great. He should come through the system. But what they do is they rush him straight to the top. The poor guys are going to get absolutely slaughtered. These guys out there are pretty big boys these days. Yeah. And I, I just think it's wrong. I think that academies, look, I don't mind if the academy is a good academy if you've got Brian Ashton coaching or someone who's been to the top who knows what they're doing. But half the academies are run by people who have never been to the top. They're mates of mates, and they yeah. what are they coaching? What are they coaching? Mm. And that is the problem. You know, in, I'm a very simple person, and uh, I look at coaching uh, as you know, if you've been around a long time, you've achieved things, you do know a bit of knowledge of the game. Um, it's this is how I look at it. You go to a university, you go to a history lesson, and you get up there, and the teacher's 21 years old. You go, oh my goodness, what's going to happen here? This yeah. person hasn't lived, hasn't done anything. I'm not saying that everyone's the same, but I'm just saying in general, if you've got someone who looks, you know, looks pretty worldly, he's about 55, 50s, you go, gee, this is going to be interesting, you know. To me, that's knowledge, you know. In Australian rugby, mm. we, we, Chris Latham, who's a great rugby player, who's coached, cannot get a job. Um, I've been knocked back many times. Um, there's a lot of players who, who I know will not get jobs because they don't want old guys anymore in Australia. They want young guys. And the reason is because they all toe the line. They all do the same thing. And it's very sad. Um, just quickly, uh, my son, Jason's 15. Um, he trialled for the Reds uh, a couple of weeks ago. And he I uh, obviously showed him uh, some of the old videos. I said, Jason, you've got to get involved. You've got to get a second touch at number 10 and do all that. So in this trial game, he got the ball in his 22 from the scrum half, dummy switch 13, sorry, 12, pass to 13. He looped around 13, gave the full back and winger scored the other ends, which yeah, I thought was nice. good. Enough. Yeah. Anyway, so on the way home, <clears throat> he said, did you see that three-on-three three drill he did? I said, no. So he got the ball, ran at someone, passed and tried as a loop, and the coach has gone, what are you doing? I'm looping. We don't want you to do that. <laughs> but you created the extra man. Uh, okay. Yep, but that's what they're teaching. Anyway, do you, so do you think it's become too yeah. academic? Oh, definitely. Mate, it, it's ridiculous. Anyway, so then the two weeks after that, they he made the trial. There's four teams, all on the same oval. I watched for two days. Not one coach taught them anything. Nothing. They stood there and told you where to go and what to do. Yeah. And I said to Jay, anyone actually spoken to you? No. Don't no feedback, nothing. I mean, they're fifteen years old. So why, where are we? Why are we doing that? You know, we've got so much knowledge around. You've got to teach players what they're doing, how to do it. But they don't. The coaches these days are educators. They're not coaches. Yeah. They don't they say this is what we were still doing, the pod system. The pod system's a waste of space. Speak to Bob Dwyer, the World Cup winning coach for Australia. He said it's the biggest rort ever. But we're still doing it at 15 years old. It's bizarre. Yeah, and... and, and uh... Look, myself, I, I've stepped into coaching this season and I, I've spent most of my time playing, you know, at the, at the front with the, the old front row. And I've seen a number of coaches that, that have come up against so far who have all the tickets, all the badges, all the bells and whistles. Um, and and it just kind of feels really, really academic. And, and I've seen that with, with some pro coaches as well. Uh, I was at a presentation once where... It was literally that. The coach was giving a presentation to the supporters and it was all statistics. It was yeah. this player has dropped this percentage of body fat, this player has done this. And and whilst, you know, great that, that it looks like progress, actually on the pitch, nothing was happening. 
they, mm. they were getting turned over week in, week out. And you go, well, statistics are lovely, but actually it's the results. It's it's a W in the in the, the, the column rather than a, yep. a percentage of body fat dropped or, or somebody can bench press, you know, X amount of, of, of weight. It, it doesn't win games at times. Um, uh, you, you, you're correct. And uh, just two little stories. Uh, I won't tell you which club, a friend of mine who played <laughs> for England many years ago, he was on a board at one of the England clubs and he said after one of the games, at home game, you walk down and one of the coaches said, we try to get 100 messages out to the field in 80 minutes. 100 messages. Now, you've got to start thinking, well, who's actually playing the game? Yeah. You know, is um, a friend of mine in Australia, is one of their cousins uh, played sevens for England and he went to play for one of the clubs. When he got there, he got a book. 200 pages, they said, read this. That's all the moves. That's all we want you to know in a book. Where to stand, what to do. I mean, it's bizarre, you know. In 1991, I wrote a, uh, in my, a book on a wing and a prayer. The last chapter was Rugby's a Dying Game. That was 30 years ago I wrote that. Because I could see, yeah. see what's going to happen. Now, in the modern game, you've got the referees who are so important. Now, who cares about referees? No one pays mm. money to watch a ref. They control the game. They're ruling the game. They're looking for everything, every little thing off, off their feet. Penalty. Go on. Mate, people don't people don't come to watch a referee. They don't want to watch the last Bledisloe Cup in Sydney a couple of weeks ago. The first half went for 51 minutes. The All Blacks had the ball for six minutes, 50 yeah. seconds. The had for 550. So basically 12 minutes of the first half, the ball was in play. Yeah. We had what, so many penalties. We had yellow cards. We had this. We had that. You can wonder why in Australia, you know, we, we're up against rugby league, Aussie rules, which is a sport that continues, doesn't stop. It's an entertainment factor. And if you don't entertain people in Australia, you can go and watch something else. But again, I did mention the IRB do not care about the Southern Hemisphere. They don't care because mm. they can't control. Yeah, we win all the World Cups. Yeah. You know, they're quite. That's what it frustrates me about the game. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great that you mentioned the Bledisloe Cup because uh, one of our, our previous guests, um, whose episode will, will go out probably just before yours, was Ben Whitehouse, who's the TMO. Um, so we had him on just before he was doing the Bledisloe Cup. Otherwise, it could have been a, a, a further interesting conversation. Um, but I, I, I totally get that in terms of, I, I remember seeing an interview, I think it was with Warren Gatland, saying that they, they've only got to concentrate on playing for 30 minutes in a half or something like that or because that's all the ball is really in play by the time you take out the scrums and the line outs and, and various other bits and pieces they have to go hell for leather for for no more than 30 minutes yeah. and, and it kind of feels like it is killing the game because I caught a bit of Aussie rules the other day and I think there are a hundred thousand people there watching I yeah. mean don't get me wrong didn't understand what was going on one bit. It, it just looked like, yeah, guys running around being brutal and just kind of, yeah, just didn't didn't understand I, it one bit. But hundred thousand people, I call it aerial ping pong. It, yeah, <laughs> very very much. Yeah, I, I played it as a kid as well, so I was very fortunate. So when I kicked the ball with the old torpedoes, I kicked straight up and down like a Nigel Will play, not around the corner. So yeah. that was very, me, you know. Um, yeah, look, it's just, it's sad that professionalism changed everything. And, mm. you know, and I think rugby, we, we went too long as amateurs. They sort of slowly changed. Like, if you think about 96, you know, the world, the we went professional. We are amateur one day, went professional the next day. That was it. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. You can't, so now, full-time job as a rugby player, people going, well, what do we do? Mm. That was impossible. Then what we did in rugby union, we went over to rugby league and got all the defence coaches. The game of rugby union is about defence now. It's not about attack. You'll yeah. have a look at the defence. It's all about defence. And if you run into a brick wall, you hit the kick, four of your teammates come over, the opposition have got no one on the ground, so you've got 11 v 15. How is that going to work? Yeah, it, it, it has kind of changed. Um, so it is a bit more kind of stop and start. Like you said, it's about defence. And, and then it's just about who's got the better kicker for the penalties that you give away and the infringements. Um, yeah. And, and and it is a bit disappointing that way because we all want to see the tries. We want to see those those beautiful things. I mean, I saw your comments about 
uh, was it Harry uh, uh, Arundel or Henry Ar- Arundel, um, and, and his one to try against Toulon. But like you yep. said, it, it's how often in international rugby are you going to get that much space, that much time on the ball to to do something, and especially when when teams are coached to the nth degree. If this happens, do this. If that happens, do that. And and it's all that kind of um, scenario kind of setting. Whereas the good old days of rugby, where it was, you know, actually stick your head up, look around, see what's happening, then do something. Thinking rugby players rather than, um, you know, robots who are just programmed to defend, defend, defend. I agree. But, you know, I, I think, the, you know, the, uh, the male species have got bigger. I understand that. They're stronger. Um, you know, it amazes me, you know, when we played, you're the best 15 in the country. You don't come off. You play 80 minutes. Yeah. You know, I, I did speak to a, a friend of mine who was is a, he was in a pretty high position in Australian rugby and he played with us. And I, I said, mate, you know, I said, can you imagine these guys going on a Grand Slam tour like we did in 84 and playing 18 games on a Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday and train every single day? You reckon these guys could do that? He said, he actually said to me, he said, the problem is these guys are soft. Not my words, someone else, but I won't mention. And he just said they are. So what happens now? They play 40 minutes. I don't understand. You go outside after second half, you're on there, and the, the, the coach pulls you off after four minutes. Oh, they look tired. You've got to take them off. Mate, you leave the best players on the field if you want to win. You know, it's all, I know professionalism, but there is a lot of, talk about, you know, why do coaches do that? Why do coaches, uh, Dave Rennie against England, the third test in Sydney Cricket Ground, they bring on a wallaby for three minutes on the wing? Yeah. But uh, it may be. I, I, well, we've got to find I, I, out, well, who, who's his manager? Um, who's his manager? And he gets extra pay for running on. So you've got to start thinking, well, it's obviously there's, it's just not right. I mean, he did nothing for three minutes. You're not going to win a game. I said, what's he going to be Superman? But that's yeah, the way the I, game – it's just sad to see these athletes who are great players be subbed, you know. Um, and I'll just go back to 2019 Rugby World Cup. You know, the reason why England really didn't win that World Cup was they lost their best player within the first five minutes. And Dan Coles, who played 20 minutes every game, all of a sudden got to play 60 minutes against one of the best scrums in the world. And you can see yeah. it, it didn't happen. So, you know, it's sad that you rely on one player to win a game. You know, you're supposed to be a team. But, um, yeah, look, it is very frustrating. Uh, we have the same problems out here. I just don't understand, you know, from our day when we were amateurs, we trained twice a week. Um, we got to win a Rugby World Cup. We got 20 quid a day. Uh, these guys have got fitness trainers. They've got experts. They've got uh, mind coaches. They've got every person you can have in the world why aren't these guys the best possible players you've ever seen why yeah. can't number pick right and left foot why can't they they've got everything what if they want to be the best why don't they do that but they don't i don't know why it must be just be an attitudinal thing i'm not sure maybe it's just the it's the era of that's how rugby is these days i'm getting picked i'm getting paid a lot of money and I, i'm just going to do what i normally do i don't know I mean, going back to to your comments about the substitutes, uh, you know, for the last three minutes or whatever, I, I've never, I've never seen the point in that because, like you said, you're not really going to, unless it, it's, I don't know, um, you're there's one point in it and you've just brought on, you know, an, an amazing goal kicker and 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 you're playing to for that final penalty to to win. What's the point? Um, what's the point of bringing someone on for three minutes? And yep. they're not really going. It, it's almost you know, a cheap cap, um, as, as certainly my dad would say. Uh, what, what kind of what's the point in it? And, and as a as a player to be brought on for those three minutes, yeah. Well, I, I think that too. Um, you know, I mean, I remember Stevie Larkin came on in a Test match for thirty seconds in New Zealand. You know yeah. what they should be? You start the starting lineup, and you get a cap. If you come off not injured, the guy that runs on doesn't get a cap. You only run yeah. on if someone's because it's a joke. I mean, guys like I know guys who have played over a hundred caps half of them sit the time on the bench, mm. <laughs> but they're still 
caps. You know, yeah. I, 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 so I understand it's professional people are going to have a go and mix them on old fart, and I think of all. But you know, I love the game. We 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 did a lot of unbelievable, exciting things. We tried things. We were allowed to to do different things. These days, you know, I sit and watch these players. You know, and I, I went to New South Wales training session a couple of years ago, Daryl Gibson. And I said, mate, these guys don't talk to each other. Yeah, we got a bit of a problem. Really? How can you not play? How can you we don't talk to each other? I just find that yeah. bizarre. I don't know what's the story. Why? Why the game has come? Why has it gone this way? Yeah, that, and that's incredibly disappointing. Uh, do Do you think that they've overcomplicated the professional game? Like you said, with with you know, coaches for this, coaches for that, and, and technology for this. And, you know, the whole substitute thing. Uh, again, I remember reading that or, or watching videos where because they're GPS and all that, they get the real-time analytics. And therefore, if somebody's not quite hitting their numbers, that there must be something wrong, so they pull them off. Do you, do you think we've gone too far in terms of the professionalism that we've tried to um, kind of over-egg things? I don't think we're professional at all. If you look at American okay. gridiron, they're nowhere near professional, really. Okay. Made a lot of, you know, and some of the things, uh, some of these, some of the plays I've seen where guys simply drop the ball. I mean, this is you, you, this, you're supposed to be the best player in the country. You know, you're doing errors, and that is the problem of the academy system going through all this because they're all superstars when they come out of school. They're nobodies. You know, I coach kids. And kids have got no idea who I am, but they absolutely give me so much cheek. And one day I went off this guy, mate, you know, what have you actually done? You know, I played for Australia for 15 years and you're 18 telling me what to do. Yeah. That's that's the generation. So, you know, it, it is an attitudinal problem. They get paid now. They're somebody's. And they're all on Instagram. They've got a fantastic Instagram page. And, you know, they think because they've got, they've got so many followers, they're, they're great. I mean, if, for us, for me, every time I played, I wanted to be better than last week's. I didn't want to rely on last week's game. You know, at the World Cup 91, we won the Rugby World Cup. The next time I went to Italy and played rugby. Just keep on going. You know, because it's history. It's yeah. changed. You can't that. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to belt you because you won the world's best players. That's why you've got to be better and better. <laughs> that was the attitude yeah. I had. Oh, if I won the World Cup, I'm great now and all that. That was never part of the way I looked at things, you know. And I tell my kids, I said, you know, if you want to be good, you got to keep on practicing, mm. you know. And I said, why is why is Messi and Ronaldo the best in the world? And I ask kids everything. Oh, because they do this. I said, no, they do the simple basics right all the time. Yeah. Every time they do the simple, stop the ball properly. Once they know that, then they'll try and experiment. They don't experiment before doing the simple things. You know, they've got a now we've got a 30 minutes, 30 meter spiral pass. You know, guys, I just don't understand the coaches of all this because it's it's frustrating to see and kids watch that. And I try and tell kids the simple basic passes, but they you know they they're thrown a meter pass spiral so hard the guy can't catch. You know, yeah, yeah. they're looking for those Instagram moments, those kind of clips, and, and I I've seen that with, with some of the players that, that I've had. Um, over the last year, two years, where they're looking for the cross field kick and and that that kind of yeah that Instagram moment, and you go, yeah, but you can't pass it a couple of meters to your fellow teammates. Why? Why? How? Why do you think you can actually run across the pitch, catch this ball, and score in the corner, and and you know get the winning winning points? If you got if you can't do the basics. And you're constantly chuck, trying to chuck something out the back door or do all these fancy things. And yet the ball gets dropped. It gets turned over. The opposition pick it up and run in a 40-meter try because you just tried something fancy. When a simple pop pass would be adequate and is what is actually needed, what, what, what's the point? You know, you've got, well, like you said, like... you've got to have that consistency. No, I agree. And, uh, you know, when I was with the Natal Sharks in 2005, Six, seven, and eight. You know, we had we had basically the South African backline. We had Bad Brad Barrett who played for England, Ruben Pina, Butch James, Waylon Murray, JP Peterson, Percy Montgomery, Francis Dane, 
And, you know, I just gave them the simple basic skills. But before games, I said, JP, just go out there, throw a bit of grass in the corner, see which way the wing's so that if you go in first half, you know, you know, should I stand deeper? That sort of knowledge I pass on, you know. The guy is, is talented. But I just yeah. try and say, try simple things, you know. There's, there's no harm in trying. Um, and you've got to communicate and help each other. So, but the problem is guys like us, we're not allowed to get involved. So these young kids have got no idea about their positional play. So what, when I coach kids, I everywhere in the world I do the same. And I'm coming over to the UK for November and I'm going to Ireland doing a couple of coaching sessions. I might do a few in England. And what I do is after the game, I say, okay, what's your name, Johnny? What position, number nine? Who's your favourite player? Oh, I haven't got one. Oh, okay. And I'll ask another guy in Australia, rugby league is a big thing and is a big block. Who's your favourite player? Oh, who plays rugby league? I said, mate, well, he's a good player, but he's not going to teach you much. He's a fullback, you're a lock. They don't know their roles. They don't yeah. know because coaches are dads, which is great. Beauty rugby, grassroots is where it all happens. If you haven't got that, so we've got a massive problem in Australia where rugby Australia's got no money. Um, yeah. Grassroots has been, you know, it's the, if it wasn't for the clubs, the volunteers, and, and things like that. I mean, we, we'd be in a bit of trouble. If we didn't have the World Cup in 27, we'd be in dire straits out here. Yeah. So how do we fix it then? How do we fix it? Well, I've always said that um, getting people involved that have loved the game, know the game, pass on some knowledge. And also, I think what's very important is we've got to play a style of rugby that people want to play. It's got to be entertaining which we did in the 80s and 90s. You know, we we came along with the Ellers in 77 and Bob DeWye. And, you know, Bob Bob was uh, probably ahead of his time because he picked me out of first grade in 1980 or 21. So I came from nowhere. So he, he stuck me. I was a wing up, fullback. He stuck me on the wing. Um, so he gave me a chance. Coaches these days go through um, academies, you know, they check all this. Um and what we did, we played a style of rugby that everybody wanted to play, and we won things. We won Bledders Low Cups. Um, yeah. I remember back in the day, it's um, in '94 we won the Bledders Low, and I went to Rugby Australia, and a really nice lady who, who there was only about five people worked at Rugby Australia instead of like 150 people now. Um, and I went there and I said, you know, can I take the Bledders Low Cup home and take it to school? Yep, off you go. Stuck in the car, off I went. So I went to a school. Sat it there, I had a single kid, had a photo with it. Okay? Now you can't even touch anything. You yeah. can't touch it. No, you can't touch you can't touch that. No, you can't have this. They've got security guards. And I'm going, well, you know, people want to see it. They want to have a look at it and see what it's like. The World Cup's the same. And, you know, that's that's how the game's gone, you know. So we need we need heroes. You know? Yeah, Every... and I think I think that's a really good point though, because Rugby has always been approachable, yeah. Uh, whereas with footballers and 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 kind of the mega stars like that, they're all very you know behind the barriers, security guards, bodyguards, whatever. But rugby, I mean, I, I remember you know, years ago um, walking into a Tesco store, and mm-hmm. and there was uh, Celesi for now, the the, the Tongan torpedo, just buying some oranges. And, yeah. and stopped and had a quick chat. You know, in the days before, you know, selfies and and, and all of that. Um, heck, I was in Costco yesterday, and Sam Underhill was wandering around. Um, yeah. You know, so you wouldn't get Ronaldo in a Costco. Um, so, ah. <laughs> so I mean, that's the whole point with, with rugby is that it, it's it's kind of a people sport, but the moment you start kind of locking it down. And again, academies and things like that. All of a sudden, you 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 end up with players are probably above who think they're better than they actually are, who kind of haven't served their time almost. Yeah, look, I don't think it's bad. It, time time's important, but also you know the thing for me, you can't coach flair. You've either got flair or you haven't. Uh, but no one in the world coaches sidestep or swerving. Yeah. You learn yourself, and I learned by watching TV. That's where I learned, you know. But so when I go coaching, I'll coach the kids. I said, right, we're going to do step and swerve, show them how to do the swerve, um, try the goose step as well. Uh, I get them to kick right foot, left foot. I said, you've got to have the skills. Um, you know, that that's what, I, what, I, what I've learned, you know. I mean, even though I'm coaching 
like I'm coaching seven, eight year olds, you know, um, and then you coach a bit higher up and you, you try and explain, but you know, the problem is once you get to 16, it's very, very difficult to change the way they are. You know, yeah. their mind is set you know? and coming through academies, that's what they want. You know, the academy system is, this is what we're going to play. This is how you do it. You ask a guy, um, I don't, I don't know. The other day I was watching Australia versus uh, the Australian schoolboys versus Japan. And it was on Facebook. So I watched the first sort of minutes. Australia kicked, uh, Japan kicked off. Australia took the ball. It's like rugby league now. We kick long, guy smashes into a brick, brick wall. So the old days, yeah. you kick it back up. No, no, we smashed it up. Anyway, the ruck was formed. Next guy took it up. 15 metre blind, nobody. So what do we do? Pod system. Pod system. Yeah. We're told what to do. No invention. Say, so, geez, hold it. Blind guys, go to blind. Halfbacks don't even look. So they're told my son at fifth when he was playing um, at number 10, he was organizing the forwards. He wasn't playing rugby. He was organizing everyone else. Yeah. You know, and that's why they can't play or see what's in front because they've got to organize the whole team. And coaches can't coach. They they, they can't coach players, try different things, you know, be snipey or halfback. Why can't you kick left foot? Oh, I don't know. Well, practice. It's not hard. So yeah. we're trying. I, I know because I've been there. I know what it's like. Some of these coaches, as you said, have got all the credentials. I've seen guys, you know, level three many years ago doing an exercise totally wrong, but they got their medals and they got their little books. And I'm going, guys, really, you know? And people, because we're old and, you know, the, we played in an amateur era, we're just sort of not relevant anymore, you know, which is pretty sad. But, um, you know, I still go out there and enjoy and trying to get sevens going now, Commonwealth game, the Olympic game. Rugby league, Aussie yeah. rules, can't do it. No one plays it, which is really bizarre. I said, well, who want, I would love to have gone to Olympic Games. You know, that was one thing I missed out on. Um, but the Commonwealth Games was great enough. And, you know, as I said, I, I've always believed that if someone says, do you want to go somewhere? You say, I'm going. <laughs> Just yeah. go. Enjoy. So if, if we took you out of, out of your, your prime – and put you into the modern game now, how do you think you would fare? Uh, well, a lot of people probably think I wouldn't be good enough, but I think it'd be pretty easy. And the reason yeah. is I game a rugby. I know how to read a game. I know where to be. Um, I um, Yes, look, guys are bigger and stronger. I understand. Well, Jonah was, I mean, you couldn't get any bigger than Jonah. Yeah. Uh, and Joel Vendiri and places like that. You've got George North running around. And you've got Colby from South Africa, who's a little guy as well. So, we still got the big guys and small guys, and the small guys are very, very quick. They step, you know, the opposition still don't know what they're doing. Uh, I was fortunate when I um, went to Italy to play uh, in 84 after the Grand Slam. Um, I played two games at fullback, got absolutely smashed. So my coach, a very good friend of mine called Vittorio Monardi, who was at Petrarca Rugby when I was there, we had lunch and he said, um, how would you like to play number 10? I said, yep, no worries. So now I'm the creator. So I played number 10. I could kick right, I could kick left foot, kicking for goals. I could do I could do pass and all that. So that my knowledge of the game grew from being a finisher yeah. now to a creator to understand the whole game. So I could sit with people and say, oh, Lottie the Kiwi's not getting the ball. Why don't I well, look where he is? It should be over here, it should be doing that. You know, so it's just reading the game. The game's the, the game is easy. It's just that these coaches have made it so complicated. Um, and then with the raw, the laws as well, with the referees, you can still be smart and play the game and pop up where you want to pop up. You know, it's it's about trust. It's about uh, passion um, and a bit of adventureness and obviously the confidence. If you've got all that and the guys, the number 10 knows what you can do in the halfback and, you know, Nick Fudge, uh, just um, a story was back in 93, we played South Africa in Australia. Uh, we lost the first test, won the second. Third test was in Sydney. And I said to Nick, in the old days, it was the old place kick 10 metres off. You know, the forwards were mauled away to near the halfway, 15 yeah. metres in. And I've noticed what the South Africans do. Uli Schmitz was in that 15 metre channel. Olivia, my winger, was like at the 22, waiting, waiting for the box kicks, obviously. So I said to Nick, you know, if it happens in the game, I'll call Leaguey. So... We kicked the goal. The ball came back. We mauled away. And I said, Nick, leaguey, leaguey. Nick looked, shook, came around, took Uli Schmidt out. I ran 20 metres. 
I passed to Tim Gavin, took the ball in. Phil Coons took the ball in again. I came outside Scotty Bowen. Scotty passed me. There's rugby for it. Yeah. Pretty simple. Again, South Africa won the boss. So it's the game. You just got to re- understand the game. But these guys are told where to go, where to stand. Uh, it's all rugby league defence, coming off the wing. Mate, my job in the old day was, if I was your man, I was supposed to stop you. I'm not going to cut in and you score four tries. I wouldn't get picked next week. Yeah. Hey, mate, you four tries. I said, yeah, but you told me to come in. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's all rugby league defence. Come in. I, I just, we've just got to go back and play our game. Why do we have to go and implement a goal line dropout in our game? Or a what is it? A fifty twenty kick. Yeah. I mean, what do you what? Why other other codes don't care about us? So why are we trying to implement what what they want in our game? It's got nothing to do with rugby. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, I, I think they are they are just overcomplicating it with with the laws. And you know, what's wrong with the old twenty two dropouts? And what's wrong with just you know kicking the ball out into touch and and just getting on with it? Um, I've seen some of the experimental laws that they're, they're looking at bringing in now, of to try and speed the game up, of scrums being set within so, you know so many seconds and lineouts being over within so many seconds and stuff like that. It just well, feels like they're, they're they're trying to speed up the they game won't. that they've already slowed down. Well, if you look at the referee against, we'll talk about the referee against Australia New Zealand. Three times in that game, he warned Foley. In the first half, Australia were down to 13 men. He warned Foley, penalty, kick now. Come on, let's kick, let's go, play. Anyway, in the second half, Callaway scored a try. It was a forward pass. The referee looked at that and told Foley, don't kick the ball. And what did Foley do? Kick the ball. Okay, the last minute of the game. He blew the whistle off. He said, right, when I blow it on, we play immediately. He blew it on. He said, play. Play. You got 13 and 12 for Australia screaming at Foley to kick it out. You got a bunch of forwards talking, and Foley's got all he had to do was kick it out. That's all he yeah. had to do. The forwards walked, which they do anyway, uh, to the game. So the laws are there. You know, people go and whinge and whinge. I said, listen, that's the laws of the game. If you don't know the laws, don't play. Mm. You've got to know the laws of the game. And now it's getting to a point where. You know, there was, uh, I think it was 2000, which one was it? There was Rod McQuay, I think um, uh, South African coach back in the day. They brought in these new L L V L E V L something, EVL rules. So basically every scrum in the in the 22 is a short arm. They brought yeah. those implements, great, because it sped the game up. But then England, that complained because the forwards were running around too much. So they got rid of that. <laughs> so we're yeah. all World Cup 91. The scrum took 11 seconds because the referee had nothing to do with the scrum. Mm. The referee involved, it's a mess. Absolute mess. And the scrum is not a weapon for the back line. It's a penalty. It's to get a penalty. That's what they do. They hold it in as long as possible because it's not about scoring tries. It's about kicking goals. That's what it's about. Yeah. And that's what's so frustrating crowds. But... You know, England, England, France is playing great rugby. England, you know, went out here. They don't care. They got down there in that third test, kicked the goal, got out, kicked the goal, got out. Australia got down there four times, kicked the line out, didn't work. You think after two, you go, guys, let's just get some points and get out of here. No. You don't want to entertain the crowd. You want to. Yeah. (laughs) And that is the disappointing thing. I I was talking with um, Reese Thomas, the uh, ex Wales prop couple of weeks ago and saying that coming from South Africa, when he came over to Wales, he had to learn how to scrummage because in South Africa, the scrums were just there to kind of restart, just get the ball in, get the ball out and, and get moving. And it was a fast paced game. Whereas in, in the Northern hemisphere, it, you know, it's scrum, scrum, scrum. Like you said, keep the ball in, put the extra pressure on, try and get the, the penalty and, and get the three points. And, and, you know, we go again and, and that's not entertaining. Um, people want to see tries. Now, do you think? Do you think if they actually change the uh, the number of points for a penalty, that we would start to see a bit more? Because they've they've talked about it a couple of times over the years. They've downgraded it to to one or two points. Okay, look, 
but why? Why do you want to change that? How is that going to make a difference? So someone said, yeah. well, let's drop goal for one point. I said, that's rugby league. Why Why should we change? Have you tried to do a drop goal? Mate, it's not easy. Mm. <laughs> I've tried times. I, did, I fail a lot. It's a skill. <laughs> it is a skill. You know, um, obviously, Johnny Wilkins was a specialist. You know, he won a World Cup. But that's that's the tightness of the game. It wasn't like, I mean, back in those days, it wasn't like, 45 to 5, like uh, the score lines are getting massive. Nowadays, you know, 21 23, what a great game. People want to see that. You know, the test mm. in uh, Melbourne, and New Zealand, they want that. They want to be on the edge of their seats. They don't want to see, you know, the week after New Zealand by 40. Yeah. You know, against Bay of Nil at one stage. I mean, really, is that is that people come to pay? No. They want to see, they want to see two of the best teams or all the best teams in the world have a go at each other. You can't yeah. change the rules to somebody. You know, we've got to play a game. But if, if you haven't got the skill factor, if you haven't got the knowledge of the game, and I'm going to say something that would be very controversial. In Australia, I don't know why we get Kiwi coaches. I don't understand. We're Australian. We play a different style everyone else. South Africans the same. They play a different style than New Zealand. New Zealand's the same. France, great now. They've got a, a, they're playing a style of rugby which... The way they're going, they'll win the World Cup next year. Now you've got Ireland. You've got all these countries playing. But, you know, we, we still – I still ask Dave Rennie, week in, what style of rugby are we trying to play? I still can't get an answer. Yeah. But no one's going to tell me because I don't think they even know. You know yeah, like, and, and this is the thing. If everybody's got coaches from the same place all playing the same way, then yep. it, 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 it's, it's going to get really, really boring because – you might as well be playing yourself. Well, I think it's also that, but, you know, the game, if you look at um, the teams that, you know, if you look at 2000 rugby, 2015 Rugby World Cup final, New Zealand had on the bench Sonny Bill Williams, Artie Sevilla on the yeah. bench. And they bring them on with like 30 to go. Have a look what they did. They destroyed the strap. So what happens if you've got no one on the bench... You know these guys can't go the eighty minutes anymore. So you've got to bring you've got to bring on match winners. Yeah, you can't bring on a twenty year old who's going to win. And and these days, you know, the hardest thing in rugby is every week's a test. There's no long tours like in '84. You know, I I was playing. I was a fullback winger, so I was on the reserve bench every every Wednesday, um, and trained every day. But you know, I could play fullback wing, and that's how you learn. Now it's a test match. It's very hard to throw guys into a test match when you're playing New Zealand every second week, South Africa and Argentina. It's yeah. not easy. In those days, you could go for a six-week tour, play a couple of midweek games, throw the young guys in. Stevie Larkham, I think it was in uh, Connick uh, in 96, played his first game at number 10 on tour. Yeah. That was experiments. So that's these. They, you can't... You know, you can't just play test matches anymore. And the young guys aren't going through systems. They're going straight from school, straight to an academy, or straight into provincial rugby, which, yes, they could be good players, but you need to get smashed by an old guy every now and then to wake up to yourself to realise, hey, mate, you know, you could have been good there, but this is how the system works, you know. You've got to be a smarter player. Yeah, and, and, and I look at the route that uh, someone like Wynn Jones, the Wales prop, took. Because didn't necessarily go through the academy, but played for Clendavery before then moving to properly to the Scarlets, and actually he's he's come out and said that playing against those old boys on on those dark and dingy Saturdays, you know, taught him a lot uh, about mm. how to actually scrummage and, and and how to go about his business, and I think you know players do miss miss that because like you said they're, they're thrown at the deep end and that those kind of those deep ends are only getting deeper um, as well because they they're getting bigger, faster, stronger, and, and it's a bigger step up. Um, so a, a look ahead to, to kind of, you know, the World Cup. You know, what, what are your kind of views? You've already said France, you know, if they continue as, as they are, then, then they could be, you know, favourites. I think they're throwing everything that they can at it because it's a home World Cup. And, and you know, who wouldn't want to win a home World Cup? How do you no, think well, everybody else is going to fail? Yeah, I think in 2007, what happened with France, and I was at the opening game against Argentina, and I think France made a big mistake. He, the coach, kept the players away from the all the atmosphere of the World Cup. And I remember I was on the Oval, 
uh, the first game. And the, and the the Argentinians were on the oval. A lot of them played in France back then. As the French come, you can see them looking around going, oh, what is this? And all the Argentinians were laughing because they'd yeah. been in the middle. They kept away. So I think this is going to be a very different World Cup for them. Um, I, I must admit, I've never seen New Zealand panic the way they did against Argentina a couple of weeks ago. They were clueless. They were, actually had no idea what they were doing in the back line. You know, they, they haven't got that um, the coolness, calmness uh, that they used to have. And uh, now you've got South Africa always play that style of rugby. They're not going to do anything different. Um and again, for us, I don't know what we want to play. Argentina, obviously very young, got some great players, but they need to to sort of create a pattern of play that's going to suit them, they want ball, which we saw against Scotland. Uh, but if you watch that Scotland game, it was sideways, 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 sideways. Both teams are yeah. running sideways. Hopefully someone missed the tackle, you know, because the defense yeah. was all about defense. So you've got to have smartness to say, right, how can we beat defense? Well, I haven't seen one dummy switch. Or one loop to try and create to bring someone out. Yeah. That's the best way in the 22. You're man on man. You create something, bring an extra man. These guys are under pressure. Um, but because the thing that's it's interesting, when you play the game, like, you know, we played a game where you catch pass, just a lateral pass. You know, you just move the ball through the hands quickly. But if I wanted to run at you, I could run at you and I could probably, like, run that close to you and get the ball away, yeah. which means you're completely... When you spiral a pass, you've got to do three or four metres away. Yeah. And that's when drifts because you can't run up to someone that quick and throw a spiral. So that's why the defence, how good is that defence? I said, well, mate, you, the, the defence didn't commit one. So the attack didn't commit one defender. Um, was a South Africa played um, the All Blacks a couple of years ago and Mornay Stane was number 10, great number 10, still playing. But he will stand 10 minutes behind the back, the scrum, get the ball and pass it sideways. The All Blacks didn't care. They just ran across and just got four guys on the, uh, a barn and smashed them into the in the touchline. Yeah. And you have not one of them committed anybody. So that's where, to me, I'd sit there, well, hold it. If you can put short hands in the space and all that, change angles. But these guys have never been taught. Because most of the backline coaches haven't really got that vision of that. Uh, they're coaches. They'll coach you one way. And yeah. instead of saying, listen, this is good, but I want you to find another way. I want you to try things. They don't do that because their job's on the line week in, week out. And that's that's the scary part about the game. And that's why I sit there and go, all he's got to do is this, change his angle, the winger. Why is the winger 25 metres away? A guy makes a break. He's got to throw a 30-metre spiral. Um, 2011 Rugby World Cup. Uh, I think it was Argentina played. Um, it was Argentina played England at um, in Wellington, and I was at the game. And England made a break, and um, was it not Foley? Who was the England fullback back then? Um, anyway, he played. Anyway, he made a really good break up to the centre of the field. His winger stayed in the tram line, so he threw threw a thirty meter pass. It bounced. By the time the winger got it. Three Argentina defenders smacked him. All yeah. they had to do was angle, and he would have scored under the post. But they've never been taught. Yeah, it, said, it's, it's two dimensional. Yeah, no, knowledge is, is is free. Knowledge is free. But these coaches get intimidated by the eye guys because I said all we want to do is get involved in help. I don't want anyone's job. You know, yeah. I think I can waste by just giving a bit of understanding. Have a look at this. Try that. You know, and, and you said you know, guys like Chris Latham can't get a job as well because we don't we don't toe the line or because we we might go against what every other coach is doing, which is really strange. Yeah, it's professional you know, sports. One one of one of the great players who could easily impart knowledge can't get a job, and, and yep. like you said, you know, coaches are are, are afraid that. You know, especially now with social media and everything like that, where you know you, you get one bit wrong and you lose a game, and then all of a sudden the fans are up in arms and and everybody is, you know, a keyboard warrior these days, voicing their opinions that they're afraid to to let loose. Well, and, I think Jeremy players. Jeremy Gascott did a he uh, was one of the players. He was a couple of years ago. He helped the the Bath Centre, who was playing for England, and um, something happened. And and Jeremy said, "Oh, 
So what happens here if I give you the ball and you dummy and there's an opportunity to take the gap, what would you do? Would you take the gap or would you pass it? He's going, oh, that's a tough one. He said, oh, I'd probably pass it. Why? Well, if I go through half the gap and it doesn't work, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> so it just shows you that you you watch. Bath's one of the best, you know, one of the England best rugby teams. Where are they now? They're yeah. last or something, are they? Yeah. 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 What? What, what, why? Tell me why. Why are they last when it's got such a great culture and history of running rugby and now they're last? Yeah. I think going from European champions years ago and and challenging to, to now being a team that, that well, are on the end of, of, of a lot of defeats. There we changing, go. They've changed the coaching staff. They've brought in loads of new players this season. And the but results are the same. They bring them from the academies, are they, or they bring up through a system? Well, I think they're, they're academy players, and, and they poach them from other teams. But the, the creativity, the spark, doesn't seem to be there, um, also, which is a, which is a shame. You need culture and history. The problem these days, these professional guys, they'll go to a club because they're getting paid money. They don't care about the history of the team. Mm. They don't care about. They, they're getting paid money. They're there. That's all they're interested in doing. Yeah. And unfortunately, that. That's life. That's what happens. But if you know, if you want to go to a club and you want to really win, you know, I, I hated losing. Even when playing the I, I hate losing. Mm. And that got better and better because I played New Zealand twenty nine times and won eight. Eight times out of twenty nine. But those eight yeah. were fantastic. <laughs> it was a <laughs> But um some people have never beaten your blacks. Yeah. But you learn. The more you play them, the more you understand it. And you know, you can't go for 79 minutes against the All Blacks. You've got to go for 80 minutes. Yeah. If you think you can, you're you 20 up at half time, I said, mate, you've got to keep on going. You know, um, you've got to make it 40. You've got to show them that you really mean business. In the World Cup 91 semi final, if you look at that 40 minutes, the All Blacks had no idea how we just took it to them. You know, we, we just put pressure on them. And they just they just panicked a bit. They panicked a bit. So, and that's that's what you got to do to them. But you got to go the eighty minutes. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, you have to play the until the final whistle because anything could happen. And yep. uh, and and I think that's where probably New Zealand were a bit, you know, uh, untouchable for a while is because you could you could pinch that try against them, pinch the lead, and then all all of a sudden they just turn the game around. And, and yeah. just come back at you, and I think they've kind of lost that. Uh, well, I moment. think what's what's very what's interesting now. You talked about that, <clears throat> excuse me. And I'll go back to uh, a couple of different games: 2019, uh, Ireland, Ireland, Japan. <clears throat> um, and I was in London airports. So after 60 minutes, um, I think Japan was beaten Ireland mm. in that game. Anyway, for the next 20 minutes, what did Ireland do for the next 20 minutes, you think? Probably panicked a little bit. Uh, did exactly the same what they did for the first 60 minutes. Had no idea how to change the game. No idea, guys, it's not working. We got to ch mm. couldn't change because all they know is one way. That's what I mean. These players need to understand if it's not working, guys. You know, uh, we played Argentina in 91 uh, in Clenethley. And in the second half, I said to Nick, uh, John said, mate, it's not working. So Nick said, right out forward, it's the next five, we'll keep it close, let's go away, change the style, get them to think. Just little things like that. If you keep on doing the same, because coach, you watch training. You watch, Okay, if you watch the game now, and it happens many times, um, if you're attacking and then the ball goes to ground, the attacking team normally gets and scores a try. You have a look at the, the scenario is that, and the reason is that training, when they drop the oh, let's go, guys, it's not good enough. Let's make sure we do it properly. So when the ball goes to the ground, someone's going, oh, what happens? Oh, oh what happens? Someone comes out of the line and they score tries. Yeah. Instead of reacting, reacting like the old days, you have to react. If it, if it fails, you've got to cover up. But they don't. We'll do it again. They want it perfect at training. I saw yeah. Sackland in so quickly in. Uh, when I lived in South Africa and uh, Richard Hill was the manager and Danny Cipriani was playing. I went to watch them train for an hour and a half. No coach, 
Every player knew exactly where they had to be for an hour and a half. It's just like robots, mate. Just robots. And that's what they think the modern game is. You run into a brick wall. There's a gap there. I don't want you to run there. I want you to run here because I want you to do your job. Yeah. Half the guys, some of the guys who think are really good and the other guys who are told what to do are not that good. Yeah, and, and, and I, oh, his name escapes me now, but there was a player over the last few years where great player, lots of flair, everything, but was coached to the nth degree. Who and was only play? allowed to do do this. Sorry? Who did he play for? I, I can't remember that. that is, I, I just remember kind of watching and, and again, reading articles and stuff of going, yeah, yeah he, was, he was really good, lots of flair, lots of passion, could read the game beautifully, but then was coached to the nth degree. And therefore, yeah. you know, engagement with the enemy, out, everything went out the window because it was almost like he couldn't, he wasn't allowed to, to kind of play yeah. with that flair. And and that was it then, kind of, you know, getting the stick from the fans and everything. But it's a case of well, you're just, and and it was probably a Welsh player because of, of you know um, uh, Warren Ball. Um, well, and, I'm, you know, I, I think I don't know. I think 2019. I'd love to know how many Kiwi coaches will coach in international teams around the world. And I think um, you know, there's so many Kiwi coaches. They all play the same style. You know, mm. because they've dominated, you know, they've got the coaches and beat a Kiwi. Um, I mean, we've got a guy who, who Mick Burns, who was the skills coach for the Wallabies. He arrived when we were third in the world. He left when he was seventh. And then he goes and coaches. He's never played rugby union in his life. He's an Aussie rule person. Yeah. Never played. Now he's a coach of Fiji. How does that work? Yeah. And he, he would, uh, but he's an Aussie rule. He's a kicker. He was with the All Blacks as a kicker. And now he's a coach. You know, I, I, that's what I don't understand. Because they're professional, I don't know. But anyway, that's my. You know, we can talk all day about the the, the problems, and I think that professionalism changed a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think slowly the French have gone away from trying to be like everyone else. The All Blacks now, now they're trying to play a style of rugby which is the French style. Yeah. You know, uh, some teams are starting to get away from what they used to. Because it doesn't work, and it's taken them a long time to understand that. But you know, for Australia, I've got I've got no idea until we understand the style of rugby. You know, we've got two centres who struggle to pass the ball. We've got two wingers that don't get the ball, yeah. um, and we we kick the ball away too much. I don't understand why. Why, why do we do a box kick? What's what's the? Is it just to get a scrum? From the scrum, we get a penalty. Then we kick a goal and we start again. I mean, yeah. that's. I don't understand the the negativity behind, you know, kicking goals all the time. Yes, you can win, but people in the Northern Hemisphere love that because that's part of their history. In Australia, we've got to compete with other sports. As you said, the grand final in Melbourne, 100,000 people. Someone said the um, Wallaby Test uh, in New Zealand, uh, they talked about ratings, I think 4.2 million what I said, well, I think it was something like that. Watch the Aussie rules. Uh, two million watch the rugby league, 190,000 watch rugby. So I hope that's not right because that just shows you you've got to compete, you've got to people yeah. want to watch. And when you've got a referee blowing up every second, looking for every single thing, you've got the TMO, you know, looking at things. Oh, can we lose a high tackle? I mean, it's just getting to a point where it's very sad. You know, and I'm getting started to get to say, well, you know, I'm probably trying to move away from rugby because it, it's very frustrating, you know, because no mm. one knows the history of who we are. Um, and you go around coaching, which I love doing, but it's just sometimes you think, is it really worthwhile? Because up the top, they're not interested. They don't give money to grassroots. Yeah. Uh, the players aren't around anymore. They don't, the kids have got no idea who the players are. So is it worth it? Yeah, it's it's a sorry state of affairs, isn't it? And, and and unfortunately, I can't see it changing anytime soon, which, well, which me, is deeply disappointing. After the uh, after the the, the French test, uh, the French referee uh, in Australia, uh, we had four or five different ex players. Not one person came to me to ask my opinion. 
but I had more. I had three interviews with New Zealand Radio. I'm having a podcast with you. I haven't had one podcast in Australia. Not one. Well, everything's yeah. overseas. New Zealand, it's overseas, it's South Africa, or well, that's 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 it. So that's that's what I mean. It's they this they just don't want people to tell certain things or say exactly how we feel. You know, we're old. It's like, it's like they say the, tr- the truth hurts. Yes, Definitely. it's that. So I mean, I mean, we could talk about these things all day long, and and, and it'd be an absolute pleasure. But what would be your advice to, to young players coming through then? Coming Look, into I, rugby. I, yeah, look, I, I think it's important that you uh, play as often as you can. Play any sport possible. Don't just stick to one sport. And because there's a lot of um, statistics show the more sports you play, the less injuries you get. I mean, I played for Australia for 14 years. I had one sciatic nerve. I had a cracked bone, a dislocated shoulder and a meniscus in my knee. But no serious injuries, no hammy problems. Um, and just... Just love what you're doing. Understand who you want to play for, why, who's your favourite player, what he does, how can you learn from them, and just be passionate and just have a great time. Uh, For parents, don't push your kids. Just let the kids enjoy themselves um, because that's what's going to happen. They they want to love, they want to play a sport that they really want to be involved with. And and I tell my son and my daughter, and I said, listen, it's just called. It just it's work ethic. If you want to be the best. You're not. You can't just turn up and practice, practice. You've got to keep on going. You want to be like someone. You want to try different things. Don't stop trying. You know, if you, if you can't find that way, find another way to work, and just just have fun. That's what I life's about. It. Yeah, for a short time. So you've got to just enjoy what you're doing. You know, and if some old guy says something to you, don't think. Oh, who's this old fart? Tell me. Look, sometimes some advice is good. Sometimes it's not. You've got to take what the good parts are and what the bad parts are. But just go out there and try as many things as you can. Nice and simple. David, it's been an absolute pleasure and, and kind of real eye-opener um, getting your views. And I really appreciate the, the kind of the open, honest opinion. Um, absolutely. Um I mean, we'll probably get you on for a second episode because there'll probably be a lot of lot of things happening in the world of rugby over the next few months. Let's have a look at the feedback. What people say. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be fine. It'll, we won't launch it in Australia. It'll be fine. <laughs> As I, uh, in Europe in November, I'm going to the Scotland, um, uh, Ireland and Wales game. So I'm around. So if you want to do something, mate, I'm around. So let me know. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, I, I was actually talking to an Aussie mate of mine. I'll give him a shout out, Matt Hasty. When I said you you were coming on, he he offered to carry the coffees, and I said, "Well, it'll be a long long way to carry it to Australia." <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, we'll definitely look at maybe doing like a live or something like that, and and grabbing oh. a coffee, and uh, yeah, it'll be great. Too. Okay, mate. Perfect. Well, thanks for your time, Thanks. David. Anytime. Thank you. Bye. Bye.